enjoy the go. You have to make spaghetti. Uh, there isn't any more spaghetti.
Hello. Hi, Mark. Hey, Kaiwa. Hey. You're back from Mount West? Uh, yeah, just just returned to two days ago. Okay. How Good are you? Trip. Great photos. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Good. All is well. Must have been good to be traveling again, huh? Yeah. So do you go anywhere? Nope, nope. Okay. Okay, I'm looking for the speaker. Mark, where are you? Oh, you have to unmute your mic. All right, there you go. Can you hear me now? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. I see you. Yep.
Okay, we have 10 minutes. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, good. Good. Mm -hmm. My volume sound okay? Yep. Okay. Nice and sexy. <laughs> That's the way we want it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we will start in about five minutes.
Okay, so it's eight o'clock and we are almost full house here in, in a Zoom. Okay, so Mark, are you ready to start? Yeah, you go on. Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the third episode of Nisi Seminar Series. So today we have Mark Miller with us. So he's the... Um, uh, a Michigan-based landscape photographer, and he has been with Nisi for many years. I, I will let him introduce uh, himself. So just a little bit of um, housekeeping before the seminar start. So um, so Mark will be talking about an hour, um, and then the, after that, it will be a Q&A session. So if you have a question, you can either leave your question under the Q&A, or you can, you can put your question in the chat room, okay? And for those of you who are on the Facebook and on the YouTube. If you have a question, please type your question in the chat room and I will monitor the question and put it in the Q&A session. Okay, so with that, I will, um, I will pass the stage to Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, thank you for having me tonight. Good to be here. Um, go ahead and start sharing my screen and uh, get going. All right, so uh, like I said, Dr. Lynn said, I'm Mark Miller, I'm a Michigan-based uh, photographer, um, Southern Michigan, a little town called Jackson. Um, I'm a landscape and freelance photographer, and I teach workshops throughout the U.S. Um, about three or four times a year, and I'm fortunate enough to be sponsored by uh, Nisi and Vanguard, who are instrumental in helping me do what I do and bringing you events uh, like we got going tonight. Uh, I've been blessed to work on some ad campaigns for a few companies, social media ad campaigns throughout the years. Uh, these are a few of them. And so how did I get started into photography? Um, about eight years ago, uh, I got my first iPhone and started taking pictures and posting them on Instagram. And before that, I had never had an interest in photography at all. And it really sparked something inside of me, created a passion and kind of one thing led to another snowball effect, I guess, and um, switched to a DSLR about six months later. And I shot everything, obviously landscapes, but I've done portraits, weddings, and some commercial photography throughout the years. Um, and from that, you know, my passion in photography, I enjoy teaching. And so I started doing instructionals and workshops throughout the years as well. Where did I learn and how did I get going in this? Um, for me, it was really easy. Um, I don't know about you, but in school, if there was a subject I wasn't interested in, it was work. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want to do it. But with photography, there was something different. Um, I had a real passion. I wanted to learn. And so I couldn't get enough of it. And I used uh, Google, um, looking up articles, reading as much as I can. Um, trying to find anything I could to, you know, help me get better as I went along, um, watched 
hours and hours of YouTube videos on everything photography related. Um, took a local class right away. Uh, I actually joined the class before I had an actual camera. Uh, so that was a little interesting in the first couple weeks. Um, but fortunately, my wife allowed me to buy my first DSLR at that time. And um, it's just, it was great after that. And then one of the best resources that anybody can use um, is other photographers. Join different Facebook groups, um, meet people in your area that have common interests and go out and shoot and, you know, pick their brain, ask questions. Uh, one of the number one things I feel um, on my workshops is there's people that always hold back and I don't know if they're afraid to ask a question or feel silly about what they might ask, um, but don't be afraid. Always ask. Everybody's learning. I'm learning constantly. And chances are someone in that group with you might have the same question. So, um, you know, definitely speak up and it'll make a difference in how quick you can learn as you go along. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, I'm sorry for interruption. Can you go full screen? What was that? Can, can you go full screen, your, your well, presentation? Oh, is it not going? Yeah. No. Um, give me a second here. I have full screen, no problem. Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah, I'm not if, sure. It's I'm okay if you can find. Everybody see okay? He's full screen. It's just other. It's like me. I'm using a wide monitor, and it only shows that part in the middle. Okay. Are we good? All right. So um, this brings us to you know, my typical settings for landscape photography. Um, the first tip that I can give you is to know your camera inside and out. It's going to make a huge difference for you while you're out in the field shooting. Um, if you're out there at sunrise or sunset and you're fumbling through the menus, trying to find, uh, you know, different settings or buttons on your camera, you're going to miss a shot. So, um, I don't recommend reading your manual because there's so much in there, but watch YouTube videos on your specific camera. Um, there's somebody out there that's done the legwork for you and you can kind of find, you know, the proper way to set up a camera and where the different buttons and settings are. And it'll make your life a heck of a lot easier when you're out shooting. And then everybody knows this for the most part, but shooting raw, you'll get the most out of your images and post-processing. Um, the only exception I would say is if you're somebody that has no interest in taking an image into Lightroom or Photoshop, um, then set your camera up with a picture profile that you like and shoot in JPEG. But if there's ever a chance you think you might go into post-processing, at the very least, you know, shoot JPEG plus raw. Um, you're just always going to have a lot better results in your post-processing workflow if you uh, shoot in raw. Aperture priority, shutter priority, or manual. So all of them work. Um, all of them work well. It just depends on personal preference. For me, I find aperture priority to be uh, the easiest and quickest way to work, especially when you're shooting at sunrise or sunset and the lights changing quickly. Um, I want to shoot in landscape photography with the most depth of field as possible. So I'm usually between F8 and F16. I seem to settle on F11 a lot. And I don't mind letting the shutter drag a little bit if it needs to. Um, the only exception is going to be if there's something in my image um, that's moving possibly in the wind, some, you know, leaves on trees or some flowers or something up close in my foreground. At that point, I would, you know, tweak my uh, ISO a little bit, um, but typically I'm going to leave that as low as possible. 
Um, your camera's native, you know, a resting spot's gonna be 100 or 200 most likely on your camera. Um, but I'll bump that up a little bit if I need to speed up my shutter, um, only to a certain point because you don't wanna introduce too much uh, noise and green into your image by doing that. So um, aperture priority works for me. If uh, you wanna shoot in manual, by all means do it. Um, to me, I just find that, you know, you, your camera can do a little bit of the work for you and you're spending that much money on a camera, you might as well let it do some work and make your life a little bit easier. Fo uh, focus and auto exposure lock. So when I'm shooting landscape, I'm always using a single point um, with my auto focus because I like to dictate exactly where my focus is gonna be in an image whether it's on something right in my foreground, something off in the distance. Um, I wanna be able to use the cursor, move it around on my screen and pinpoint exactly where I want it to be. And if you're doing uh, focus stacking, um, that's gonna you know, be all that more helpful because then you can just move your cursor out as you move through your image. Um, I will use manual focus to fine tune from here and there. Um, I use it a lot when I'm using neutral density filters. So you almost have to, because uh, once you put a six, 10 stop on there, it's not gonna be able to autofocus anyway. And then auto exposure lock is kind of a little trick that I use a lot when I'm working with graduated filters. What I like to do is point my camera down um, and expose for the foreground, get it to look exactly the way that I want. Then I'll lock my exposure there and bring the camera up and uh, compose my image, focus, and then slide the graduated filters in and shoot that way. Um, it's uh, on most cameras, um, it'll work right from the get go out of the box. You hit it and it locks the exposure. Some cameras, uh, for some reason, you have to hold that button down. Um, you gotta just go into your settings and you can tweak it so it'll actually lock it. So you just push it one time and it locks your exposure where you want. And then obviously as lights changing, uh, you undo it and redo it as needed. But it's a little trick I use. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but I find it pretty beneficial. So that brings me to planning. Um, if you're traveling, um, for photography or just for pleasure and you're gonna go out and shoot, um, knowing when and where to be is gonna be a huge key and save you time while you're out there. So what I like to do when I know that I'm going somewhere is research the location. Um, there's lots of tools to do it. You can Google best places to shoot in, you name it, and you'll find all kinds of articles on different places um, in that area. Um, I, actually, I go on to Google Earth a lot and I will find the location that I'm going to and I'll zoom in and just kind of scroll the landscape and look for points of interest. Um, if I know that I'm gonna be by the beach um, and I'm in a hotel, I'll find where my hotel is, zoom in and then just scroll along the shore and see if I can find piers or rocky seashores, anything at all that might interest me. Um, another couple tools. There's Instagram and Flickr. You can just put in keywords and search and find all kinds of stuff and look for images that you like, something that you might want to go see. And then once you find some points of interest that you want to shoot, um, always go on Google and try to find out as much about the location as possible. Um, directions on how to get there, parking, a lot of places you're not going to have a parking lot sitting there waiting for you. So you need to know um, exactly where to go and when to be there. Uh, this shot here was taken out in Laguna Beach last uh, December. I was fortunate and got to travel with my wife on one of her business trips. And when I found out that I was going, um, I used the tools that I just spoke about and found uh, this place called Pirate's Castle or Pirate's Tower. It looked really cool and I knew it was a place that I wanted to go to. So uh, I 
did my research on it and I actually found a blog that somebody, another photographer had posted about it. And uh, they gave very specific directions and parking instructions on how to get there. And um, thank goodness I did, because I don't think I ever would have found it without uh, that article. You actually had to park on the Pacific Coast Highway and then walk across into a side street in a subdivision. And as you're walking through there, you come to a little gate and there's a set of stairways down to the beach. And it looks like you're walking through somebody's, you know, side yard. I would have thought I was trespassing, but it's a public access and uh, it's really pretty hidden. So without uh, doing the research, I never would have found it. And fortunately I got there and it was a awesome night and well worth uh, the venture out there. Um, the best times to shoot a location, um, weather, direction of the sun, um, all very important uh, factors and when you're shooting. Um, so when you're looking at the locations that you wanna go to, you need to find out when's the best time to shoot it. Is it a sunrise location, sunset, um, maybe it's midday. And then while you're out there, pay attention to the weather. Um, there's a lot of tools to help you with that. And uh, these are a few of them that I use, um, photo pills, uh, different weather and radar apps, um, the photographer's ephemeris. And it's a really cool app. Um, you can see over here, you can drop a pin on the location where you're gonna be. You can go to the day and time that you wanna be there. And you can see exactly where the sun is supposed to rise and set, um, same with the moon. So it's all keys and planning and making sure that you can make the most of a location while you're uh, going out there to shoot it. Timing um, and getting off the path. So the early bird gets the worm, they say. And I always say, if you're going somewhere, get there early, um, well ahead of time that you wanna shoot. You wanna be able to scout the area. If you hadn't been there before, um, look for interesting compositions. And if it's a popular place, you're gonna to wanna to beat the crowds to make sure you can get where you want. If you don't, you end up like this. Um, this was out at one of my workshops in Moab a couple of years ago. And we got out there and you can see I was one of a hundred so photographers people want to see um, Delicate Arch. And it, it's crazy. I mean, you go to a popular place, you're gonna see lots of people and you wanna be able to get the best shot possible. So get there early. Fortunately, um, I was able to settle in and find a spot to drop a tripod and was able to capture a pretty nice long exposure at sunset. So didn't walk away empty handed despite the crowds, but it was quite the scene there that night. And then venturing off. Um, if you go to a popular place and it's crowded um, there's going to be other things there to shoot. Don't be afraid to walk away and look for some other points of interest. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Jamie McDonald, and I went to Michigan's Upper Peninsula a few months ago to shoot waterfalls. And this first shot here uh, was of Bond Falls. It's an awesome waterfall, the, clearly the main focus and point of interest there. And most people are going to go there and shoot that, see it and um, that's all they're gonna see. And I gotta give credit to Jamie. He's the one uh, that found the second shot here it is directly to my back of the first image. Um, there was a wooded area and he ventured off, walked back there and found this little spot where the waterfall, you know, ran off into a stream and it had a really nice composition with the two trees framing the stream, just running off into nowhere. And it's actually one of my favorite shots uh, from that location, um, despite the waterfall being the big main attraction. And uh, so don't be afraid to walk around, explore, look for different points of interest when you're at a location, especially if it's crowded, you know, get in there, get your shot that you want, um, but look for something else. You never know what you might find. So composition, what do we do uh, when we get out there and we're ready to shoot? 
Um, I'm going to give you lots of tips here, but keep it simple. Sometimes less is more. You don't have to put all of these tips into every single shot. Some work for some and some don't. So just keep them as a guideline, some ideas to kind of help make your composition interesting. Um, but don't get overwhelmed with it. You know, just get your shot. So the first tip is horizons. Um, always try to get yourself a nice level, even horizon. Nothing's more distracting than having a crooked horizon. Um, it just kind of makes the whole image look a little bit wonky and um, it's not what you want in your images. And then I typically like to use the rule of thirds with my horizon as well. Um, I like to either put the horizon line on the lower or upper third, depending on the composition and the image that I'm shooting. On this one here, I've got it in the lower third. And obviously the sky was more of a interest than the foreground. I didn't have a foreground element. So that's why I balanced it that way. And here you can kind of see the grid as to the rule of thirds. A lot of cameras have this built in so you can actually shoot with it on to kind of help you compose as you work. Um, but you can see the horizons right on the lower third. And then my pier kind of runs out and drops into that bottom third corner as well. Sky versus foreground. Um, a lot of times you gotta decide what's the point of interest in your photo. In this particular shot, um, the rocks and the rushing water over top of them is clearly what I was trying to capture. So my horizon is up in the upper third. Um, there was a nice sky, but the foreground was the more the important part of the image. And that's why the photo was balanced that way. Leading lines and angles. Um, leading lines are a great way to draw your viewer's eye to your subject. So in this particular image, the lighthouse is my subject and I composed it with the rails of the boardwalk running directly back to your lighthouse. And I like to typically start my leading lines from the corners when possible. And it just kind of draws the eye straight into the middle there. And I've got the lighthouse situated in the right third of the uh, frame there. Um, I typically don't shoot a lot of shots with my subject dead center. I use the rule of thirds and place it in one of those uh, particular areas. Here's another one with leading lines. Uh, the mountain range back here is the subject and I compose the shot with uh, kind of an S curve line. Doesn't have to be a straight line. And I'm starting it from the corner again. And as you see, it runs through the frame and draws your eye back toward the mountain. Um, pretty simple concept. It's just a easy way to draw your uh, viewers focus into the middle of your frame or where you want your image. Uh, one more here with leading lines. Um, the lighthouse again is the subject matter. And I composed the shot with the rocks here in the foreground leading out to my uh, lighthouse. And the rocks there in the foreground kind of help create a little bit of depth to the image and draws the viewer's eye out to my subject. And it's balanced all on the right side of the frame again. Um, like I said, using the rule of thirds, I typically I'm not going to have anything dead center. Um, this one's leading lines and kind of angles here. So I, the subject in this uh, particular image is more so the sky than anything. It was a beautiful sunrise and some pretty epic clouds. And so I kind of got back on the boardwalk and shot using um, compose it with the angles of the, the rails in the boardwalk leading out to the clouds. Um, just a different way to kind of line up the shot. I did take a few other ones that day, um, but I like this one the best, just using the lines kind of shooting out from the corner into the clouds. And 
And then always you want to watch your edges um, of your frame. Don't let things creep in that could be a distraction. In this image, I use the rocks in the foreground and I use the buoys leading out to my subject, which was this little mountain range and the clouds and morning fog. But if you look right here, your eye kind of gets drawn to this little island off on the side and it's a distraction. Um, unintentional, it's subtle, but as you're viewing the image, it creeps into your peripheral vision and you don't want something like that pulling your viewers away, uh, eye away. So um, watch for tree branches, little islands, things like that. Um, they can be uh, a little bit of a nuisance that's subtle, but it's just enough there to kind of break down the image. Um, what I should have done was either zoomed in a little bit more to get that out um, or composed in portrait orientation possibly. Um, it's just, a, like I said, a little subtle thing. Some people don't really uh, notice it, but it can't, your eye can't help but see it. And it's not any uh, part of the image there. It's just uh, works more as a distraction. Uh, so in this one, I cloned it out in Photoshop. So it's subtle, it goes away and you're not gonna see it there in your peripheral, which flipping back and forth, you can kind of tell that it is a bit of a distraction. So watch your edges when you're composing. Um, just look at the frame, make sure there's nothing there that's gonna take away from what you're trying to tell the viewer. Um, at the last, last little section here, we got vanishing points. Um, one thing you can do when you don't have a specific subject or something in your foreground is look for ways to draw the viewer's eye basically endlessly through your image. Um, vanishing points are a great way to do that. I use that a lot um, in my work. This particular shot was earlier this fall. Um, I shot it three different ways. Um, I shot it standing up on the side of the road with the road kind of running an angle from corner to corner. Um, I took a shot standing straight up vertically in the center of the road. And then the last one, I dropped the camera right down on the ground and composed the shot right between the yellow lines. And to me, this was a much more compelling image because You've got the leading lines of the road running off endlessly into the frame and they play well with the color of the autumn leaves there. So different angles um, can make a huge difference in how your composition works and whether it's an image that uh, works well or it's just a snapshot, so to speak. Uh, here's one more, uh, same thing. This one I stood in the road and it was a better way to capture the S curve going out of the frame. So it's another way that the leading lines coming from your corners of your image, uh, they're drawing the viewer's eye and it just takes it off into nowhere. There's no real subject. It's just a nice scene and um, it works well, like I said, with the vanishing points. And then a couple of bonus uh, tips here, natural framing. Um, when it's possible and it's, uh, nature lends itself to you, you can use trees, um, you know, rock walls, cliffs, something to kind of frame your subject. So in this image, uh, the lighthouse is the obvious subject and I kind of cr uh, crouched down here in the reeds and you've got the uh, reads kind of angling up from the sides, pointing um, directly at the subject. And this is one image that I did center uh, my subject right in the middle. Um, it seemed to work with the uh, natural framing there. Um, and then again, my horizon is in the lower third as I was looking up into the blue sky and the white clouds. So um, like I said, just keep your eye open and see what works best for the uh, shot you're trying to capture. And then isolation. Um, don't be afraid to break out a telephoto lens for landscape photography. I'm a huge sucker for wide angle um, 
you know, big and um, expansive landscape shots. Um, but sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, this particular shot was out in Whistler, uh, Canada. And uh, I was trying to shoot this mountain range with a wide angle lens and it just wasn't working. I had a, you know, tiny mountain in my image and you really couldn't see what I was trying to capture there. So I switched to a telephoto lens and zoomed in and just shot the peak of the mountain. And it's a much more interesting and compelling image than a wide angle shot of the mountain. It, you can see, you know, how big it is. You've got the snow kind of blowing off uh, the top of the mountain there in the sky. And it worked really well with the black and white for this particular image. Um, so like I said, don't be afraid to break out a telephoto uh, for landscape. It's not always about, you know, big wide open spaces. So making the most out of ordinary locations. Um, if you're someone like me, I don't live near waterfalls. I'm not by the beach and um, I don't have mountain ranges, nothing that's overly exciting. Um, I live in a small town area, a lot of cornfields, uh, small lakes and ponds. And it's real easy to kind of get sucked into, you watch social media and see the big, beautiful uh, mountains and Okay, I think Mark um, is losing the connection. Uh, let me get him back. Okay, I'm um, sorry about that. Let me get uh, Mark back to the presentation. If everyone would kill their videos, it would help the bandwidth. Okay, so he, he's trying to get in again. Thank you. 
Okay, Mark, welcome back. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear you, Mark. All right, we good? Yeah, welcome. All right, back. sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Just kind of booted me out. All right, so uh, do you guys get the last slide about uh, the last one on composition? All right, so making the most out of ordinary locations. Um, start the slide over. So if you're like me, uh, I don't live um, near waterfalls, mountain ranges, or beaches. Um, I live in a small town, lots of cornfields and uh, small lakes and ponds, stuff like that. So it's tough. And sometimes you get caught up in social media and seeing all these epic, beautiful locations. Um, but if you're not able to travel a few hundred days out of the year, what do you do? So you got to make the most out of what you've got. And always keep in mind that what may seem ordinary or boring to you might not be to somebody else. So it's still fun to capture. It's good to go out and shoot and just kind of uh, try to find creative ways to make the most out of what you've got. Uh, so the first tip, um, take a drive, bike ride, go for a walk, um, take different ways home. Just look for different things that you might not see go out and with an intent to shoot and just see, you know, where your mind takes you and what you might come across. Uh, this first image here, is just a simple cornfield. And I was driving past it one day, it had a nice big blue sky with some white clouds and I saw this path cutting through it. And so I just kind of got in there and composed the shot. Um, with the leading lines coming from the corner again and using the vanishing point uh, just running out into the sky there. Um, so it's just a cornfield, but it's a way to capture and make it look a little bit more interesting. Um, lone trees, old barns, ponds are all great things to kind of make a minimalist uh, composition. This is a tree out in the middle of a field. Um, I composed it with these little rocks here in the foreground kind of leading out toward it. Um, unfortunately, they kind of blended into the foreground a little, but that's what I was going for. Um, but like I said, just a simple lone tree. I used it and put it up in my upper third of the uh, image there. And it makes a nice, uh, you know, landscape photo. It's pretty simple, but it works. Lone barns, old barns are uh, one of my favorite things to shoot. Uh, this particular one, there was nothing there of interest in the foreground. Um, so I composed with the horizon in the lower third. Um, and then I took a nice long exposure at sunset to create a little bit more of a dynamic image. As you can see the clouds moving through the frame. Um, it just makes a lot more, it gives it a lot more interest um, than just a static photo there. So you've got this old weathered barn, nice, you know, colorful sunset going on. And it's another uh, image I shoot barns all the time. Uh, they're just a great find when you live out in the country. Chase a storm. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do when the inclement weather's coming. Um, go out, get ahead of it, and see what you can capture. You might get some awesome clouds. Uh, you can shoot the lightning. Um, it can enhance uh, an image quite a bit. So this particular field is fairly close to my house, and it's really uh, nothing of interest that I would shoot on any ordinary day. It's small. There's nothing there. Um, but this day I went out 
you know, uh, with the intent of trying to capture some nice uh, storm images. And I got lucky and there's this huge shelf cloud sprawling across the field. Um, so I got down kind of low on the side of the road there and composed the shot with uh, basically these weeds, a little bit of flowers in the foreground. And you've got this big shelf cloud sprawling across uh, the sky there. And again, uh, composed it with the horizon in the lower third because the sky was the uh, obvious point of interest here. It's another storm one. Um, this uh, was in a huge storm cloud kind of lingering over a uh, cornfield in the early spring. Uh, the field was flooded. You can see the reflection down here. So that's why I kind of shot low. You got the corn stalk coming up in the frame, a little bit of a reflection in this heavy ominous cloud sitting above it. Um, like I said, it's uh, finding creative ways to make an image work. Um, ordinarily, cornfield is not going to be something that you're going to want to shoot. Um, it's finding the right conditions, going out and um, shooting what's there to make it work for what you want to do. Um, reflections are another great way to shoot landscape. This is a tiny lake over by my house. And I went out um, earlier this fall with the intent to shoot some fall colors and happened to drive over to this lake. And it was a beautiful morning. The sun was lighting up the trees across the lake, uh, making a nice reflection. And there was nothing else there to shoot, no foreground interest with it. So I just composed the shot in portrait orientation and wanted to capture the sky reflecting on the water with the tree there in the horizon. And real simple shot, um, but it's one of my favorites from this fall. Uh, it's a great way to capture the fall colors there. And when all else fails, narrow your focus. Um, this night I went out uh, wanting to shoot sunset and mother nature wasn't giving me uh, anything really exciting, another small lake by my house and kind of had a dull sunset and it's kind of bummed. Um, and as I was there walking the shoreline, I saw this red leaf just kind of washed up on the shore and thought it might be a cool shot. So I zoomed in, narrowed my focus and just took a simple shot of this red leaf uh, washing up there on the shore and if I had shot the entire lake, there wasn't, there wasn't anything there of real interest, no great color, would have been a pretty boring night. Um, but this is a very simplistic shot. I've actually sold quite a few prints of this one and uh, I was definitely happy with how it turned out. And like I said, narrow your focus. It's not always the big scene. Sometimes uh, the little details can make a huge in, uh, impact. So the benefits of shooting with filters, um, you've got two kinds to work with. Um, you've got your round screw on filters or the square or rectangular slide in filters. Um, I personally prefer the rectangular slide ins and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but the benefits are um, they can enhance your creativity for one. Um, you can do a lot more than a standard uh, shot with your camera by using them. Um, specific ones will cut glare and reflections. They can enhance colors and contrast. And it helps you get the proper exposure in camera when you've got high contrast scenes. And obviously you're able to shoot long exposures. Are filters needed in the digital era? Um, absolutely. Um, Circular polarizers are irreplaceable. You can't duplicate that in Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, graduated uh, neutral density filters, you can uh, work without those by shooting bracketed shots when you're in high contrast scenes and blending them in Photoshop. Uh, your post-processing is gonna be a little bit more labor intensive, not bad, but a little more work um, than it has to be. And then neutral density is pretty irreplaceable. I know there's at least one camera out there that has a digital uh, version of a long exposure now. Um, 
does a pretty good job, but it's still not going to be quite what you could get um, if you were using uh, actual neutral de neutral density filters at time of shooting. Uh, so first off, the circular polar circular polarizers um, they are going to cut glare and reflections um, on non-metallic surfaces, so your windows, uh, water. Uh, stuff like that. Um, they can enhance your contrast and saturation, and then they'll reduce your shutter speed by about one to two stops. So if you're in a low light area trying to do a longer exposure, you could probably get away with using one of those. Um, some examples of what they do, uh, the circular polarizer, the first image here is shot uh, without it. And you can see I've got a heavy glare here on the water. And then you put the polarizer on and you can see how clear and um, the reflection is completely gone from that image. Uh, another example, same thing, um, no polarizer here on the left. And I've uh, got a kind of a high contrast scene with the sunset. So the sky's overexposed and we're losing the highlights. This one, I've got the polarizer on. So my foreground looks really nice. You can see the rocks there in the foreground. And then I took the polarizer and mixed it with a medium grad uh, rectangular filter slide in. So you can see it brought back a lot of the detail in the sky, fixed some of the highlights there. So going from this here to this, you've got a pretty nice image right from the get go, straight out of camera, um, just by using the filters there. And then here's the end result of the processed image. So, Started here without the filters and built my way through the Okay. Okay, sorry about that. This happened again. Let me get him back to, to the Zoom. Okay, welcome back, Mark. Um, you got me? Yeah, welcome back. Yeah. I, I apologize. I don't know what is going on. Weird night. No problem. All right, so let's try to get back into this thing. All right. Um, so, like I said, um, by using the polarizer and a medium grad, is able to get a nice image straight in camera. Share a screen, Mark. Oh, is it not sharing? Come 
Okay. Yeah. Good to go. Is it up now? Yep. Okay. Good. Jeez. Technical difficulties like crazy. Um, so yeah, so I was able to capture a nice image in camera um, by using a polarizer with a medium grad here. And like I said, that's the processed image. Uh, so neutral, uh, graduated neutral density filters. Um, these are great for high contrast scenes, um, getting your exposure correct in camera and it's gonna cut down on your post-processing time. Uh, the first one, you've got a medium grad, uh, which is gonna be darkest at the top and kind of works its way down uh, to the middle until it's translucent. And it's gonna have a little bit harder of a transition. Uh, the soft grad uh, works the same way, but it's got a much uh, more subtle transition from dark uh, to clear. And your hard grad is going to have a very hard fine line, which is great for shooting uh, open uh, water horizons where you don't have any mountains or trees, anything that you uh, don't want to be affected by the uh, darkest part of the filter. So it's great for shooting seascapes, um, big lakes and things like that. And your reverse grad uh, is going to work the opposite. It's going to be the darkest on the horizon. So it works really well for sunsets when the sun's very low on the horizon and you'll have uh, the foreground is translucent and then it works in reverse, obviously up toward the top of this uh, frame. Some examples of that, um, this shot was uh, just a couple weeks ago at sunrise. Um, I exposed well for the foreground, but you can see the highlights are blowing out and I've got no details in the sky. So I could obviously bracket the shots or I used a medium grad filter and you can see it slides in, brings back all of your detail and color uh, in your bright, high contrast scenes. Um, here's a, another one where I kind of build the shot for you. So uh, no filter, the sky's overexposed and highlights are kind of blown out, but my foreground looks uh, pretty good. The logs and uh, detail there, there's not much in the shadows. The next shot, uh, no filter, I exposed correctly for the sky but my foreground is lost now. It's all dark and heavy shadows. So you've got the option there where you can take the two into Photoshop and try to blend them together, or you can work with filters. So I took an exposed for the foreground and dropped a hard grad uh, neutral density filter in, and you can see it brings back the sky and I've got a properly exposed foreground. So it's one image straight out of camera and you've got everything exposed correctly in a, a high contrast scene. And then there's the processed image afterwards. Uh, and one more, same thing, um, no filter, sky's overexposed on the brightest side where the sun is, highlights are gone, a little bit of the details and the clouds are lost. And I put a medium grad filter in and once again, the whole image is completely exposed and balanced straight in camera. Um, no need to do any heavy lifting in Photoshop afterwards. And then the processed image afterwards. Um, the last one, I don't have a before, unfortunately, for this one, but this is an example of a hard grad. I uh, shot this out in California. I used a uh, hard grad filter to keep the color and details in the sky and still bring out some of the shadows in my foreground. And I used a neutral density filter with this also to run a little bit longer exposure uh, to kind of blur the water. So that brings us to neutral density filters. These are my favorite. I use them the most. Um, they're a great way to create a dynamic scene with motion. Um, you can also use them to help get rid of people in a scene. So if you're at a busy uh, touristy area and there's lots of people moving um, around your subject, 
Um, instead of trying to wait them out, you can take a longer exposure. And as long as the people keep moving through your frame, they won't uh, actually show up in the image in the end, unless they linger a little too long, then they might ghost a little bit, but it's easier to clean up and post-processing that way, um, rather than trying to go in and remove a hundred people out of your shot. And then uh, what everybody loves, it creates that soft dreamy look to your water um, and you get those nice uh, cloud trails. So some examples of that, here's a shot um, up on the lake shore, Lake Superior is a big tree uh, laying there on the shoreline. And I took a shot and you've got your water, it's just kind of frozen there in time. Not that exciting of an image. Um, with that image, it was a one one hundredth of a second. And I put a 10 stop neutral density uh, filter in and took a 10 second exposure. And I liked it better in black and white than color, but you can see where you've got that kind of dreamy uh, blur of the water rolling up against the tree there, a little bit of movement in the clouds, and it makes a much more compelling image than just a static snapshot. Uh, here's another one uh, that took this shot, uh, Lake Michigan, and I used a hard uh, grad to expose for the sky but I've got the frozen water there. I've got some driftwood laying there kind of to use in my foreground. And once again, it's just not that exciting of an image that way. So I added a 10 stop filter, got a 10 second exposure out of it. And instantly it becomes a lot more compelling. You've got that smooth glassy water. It's kind of that dreamy look and a lot more uh, interesting than just a static uh, frozen water. For me, um, shooting with neutral density filters around water is a lot more fun and makes a lot better of an image in my opinion. And then there's the final processed image of that one afterwards. Uh, this next one is Tacomanon Falls in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I don't have a before, unfortunately. Um, but again, you can see the effects that a neutral density filter has. It's, uh, I was able to shoot with a six stop, uh, neutral density filter here, got a 16 second exposure. And I composed this with, uh, the foam coming off the waterfall there. So it kind of uses the leading lines and an S curve right back to your subject. And obviously the subjects, you know, this beautiful waterfall. Uh, back in the autumn time. And it's probably one of my favorite images that I've ever taken. Uh, another example here, um, this is up on Lake Superior in the UP, uh, just a static frozen image, one two thousandth of a second. Uh, you've got the waves kind of crashing there on the, on the rocks. Um, not a bad image by any means, um, but you put a neutral density filter in and once again, it's in my opinion, a lot more interesting of a photo. Uh, I used a 10 stop stacked with a three stop um, of the rectangle filters and was able to get a four second exposure there um, in a pretty high midday scene. And uh, I like the way that that one turned out quite a bit. Uh, there's another angle of Tequamanon Falls. Uh, this does have a before, so you can see the static frozen water there. Um, one's uh, 640th of a second. And then with a 10 stop filter on, I was able to get a 1.6 second exposure. And instantly you get that uh, nice soft water, a um, little bit of cloud movement there, not a whole lot, but it's a to me, a lot more interesting of a photo again, um, just by the use of filters, nothing really tricky there. And then uh, these last two, I don't have before shots, but this was in Grand Haven, Michigan. And we we're out shooting, uh, tried to go out and shoot sunrise that morning and we were there a little bit early. So I shot this at blue hour. Um, I would have typically used a six stop here, but and that trip to the UP, I accidentally dropped it and broke it. So I had to put a 10 stop in and took a 190 second exposure. And you can see what it did to the water there. It's nice and 
uh, smooth and then you've got a ton of movement in the clouds. So you've got this nice hard static image of the lighthouse and the pier with the rocks and then everything else moving around it. Um, and it's a great way, like I said, to create a dynamic scene. And then this last one is Mosquito Falls in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And uh, again, I used a three stop here, got a two second exposure and it just creates that nice, uh, you know, dreamy magical look to the waterfall. And again, another one of my favorites. And that's why I love uh, shooting with neutral density filters. Um, so if you wanna use uh, neutral density filters, quick tips here, how to calculate your exposure time. Um, there's all kinds of charts and math that you can do, but the easiest thing is to get a long exposure calculator app for your phone. There's tons of them out there. Uh, Nisi has their own Nisi filters app and it's very simple. Uh, you basically figure out what your exposure is going to be before you put your filter on uh, for your shutter speed. Enter that into the first line there in the app. Then you put in the uh, neutral density filter that you plan on using and it spits out an exposure time for you. So uh, this example would be two minutes and 16 seconds. Um, your camera you put on bulb mode, um, click go on this app and it'll actually run the timer and ding when it's time to let off and you're good to go. Uh, for me, my essential filters uh, for landscape photography, um, I have, like I said, I prefer the rectangular and uh, square filters. So I've got to have my filter holder with a built-in circular polarizer. I like to use uh, soft and medium grad filters. And then I'm always going to have a six and a 10 stop with me. Um, those for me seem to be the most versatile and ones that I use the most. There's obviously a lot of other ones out there um, and it depends on your style and what you want to do. But if those are my recommendations, uh, this is where I would start out. Uh, a few things to consider if you're interested in buying filters. Uh, first, what kind do you want, round or square? Um, the round ones screw onto your uh, lens. Um, you can stack them, but if you stack too many, you're going to introduce some vignetting and uh, a little bit of a distraction in your images. That's why I prefer the square ones. You can stack uh, two or three of them up and it's not going to affect your image. Um, what type of filter, uh, the material you can use, uh, resin or glass. Uh, they do have acrylic ones out there, but I would uh, recommend staying away from those. Um, if you're going to have, you know, a thousand dollar lens on your camera, I wouldn't put the cheapest filters in front of it. You're just going to degrade the quality of your images. Um, some pros and cons between resin and glass. Um, the resin is going to be cheaper. Um, they're flexible, um, so they're not going to shatter if you drop them but they are a little bit more prone to scratching and harder to clean. Um, and you tend to lose a little bit of uh, optical clarity, a little bit of sharpness with them. Um, that's why I prefer the glass ones, a nice high um, optical quality glass. You're going to have a nice sharp image. You're not going to introduce any color casts um, to your images but they do cost a little bit more um, and they do shatter when you drop them. As I said, I lost one a couple months ago, unfortunately. Uh, the thread size of your lenses, you're gonna need to know that when you're going uh, to pick out what you want. Um, every lens is gonna have a different uh, filter thread on them. So you need to make sure you know which ones you have so you can buy accordingly. If you're gonna go with a uh, round screw on filters. I personally recommend buying the largest one um, for the your largest lens and then using step down rings to any smaller uh, lenses that you might have. That way you're not having to buy multiple filters for multiple lenses. Um, ultra wide angle lenses, um, typically those are not going to have a filter thread on them um, because of the nature of the design 
they don't have, uh, or they've got the concave glass. So round filters aren't going to work on them and you're going to need a special filter holder um, for that particular lens in order to fit on there correctly. So that kind of brings us to the end here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining tonight. Uh, I've got some contact info there and uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I always answer any questions, um, comments that you might have. Feel free to contact me and I'd be glad to help. And at this point, um, you know, we can open the floor up to uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, okay. Um, so we have a question from Daniel. So what is the difference using filters? We, um, using filters and with no filter, but editing in the raw processing in the Photoshop. I think he referred to um, the graduated neutral dance filters. What was the question? I'm sorry. So what is the difference with using and uh, the filters and without using filters, but editing in the raw processing in Photoshop? Okay, yeah. So uh, when you're using uh, the graduated filters, you're able to capture and, um, all in camera an even balanced exposure. Um, if you're gonna go into Photoshop with uh, stack images, you're gonna have to layer them and try to blend to get your exposure. Um, Okay, Mark, are you still there? <laughs> okay, let me try to get him in again. Sorry about that. Okay, um, maybe I can answer the question while we are waiting to mark, get back to the presentation. Oh, I think it's back. Okay, Margaret, I'm near your mic. Can't hear you. I can't hear you, Mark.
Okay. Mark, are you there? All right. You got me again? Yeah. Welcome back. Okay. Peace. Oh, peace. What a <laughs> night. Mm -hmm. um, so back to that question about processing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, like I said, if you're shooting stacked images, um, it's going to be a little bit more work blending those in Photoshop. Um, if you get it right with filters in camera, um, your post-processing is basic. You can just tweak your contrast, saturations, um, you know, minor tweaks. It's not nearly the heavy lifting that you would have to do if you're trying to blend exposures. Okay. Okay, another question from Jess. What is your workflow when using the, the graduated neutral dance filters? Do you focus first, then insert the graduated filters or the other way around? Um, with the graduated filters, you can do it either way. Um, I tend to compose and focus um, all first and then slide them in. Um, only when you're using neutral density filters, the really dark ones, do you need to pre-focus before sliding them in. Um, but my particular workflow is putting the filter in last. Okay. And question from Chris, when in the field, uh, are you taking a variety of exposure with different neutral dense, density strength and then choose, choosing which one works best on your computer? Or do you have a stat looks in mind? Um, yes and no. Um, typically, um, I've got a pretty good idea of what I want to do. And um, I'll set up that way. But one tip when you're out shooting, take as many different exposures as you want. Um, it's, it doesn't hurt to go home with more in the digital era. You're not throwing away, you know, bad shots with film. So if it works for you and you want to take some different exposures, play with different filters, by all means do it. Um, you're not going to lose anything by getting more. I'd rather go home with more than, uh, not enough. Okay. And question from David, why is a filter apps needed to be get the uh, exposure? And what camera career? Huh? Sorry? Why is the filter app needed? Yeah, yeah. Why why we need the, the filter apps? Wouldn't camera create a very long exposure on if on the aperture priority? Um sure you could do that. Um typically when I'm using a neutral density filter, I shoot in manual mode. And um, I like to work with the app and tweak from there. Um, you could let it run with aperture priority if you really wanted to, I suppose. Um, it's not typically the way that I work with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think another point is that um, when um, usually when uh, the, the camera works in, um, in estimating the exposure time when you're using a six stop anti filters, but when you're using a 10 stop anti filters, um, the camera doesn't read beyond the 10 stop. So you have to use the apps beyond that. Yeah. 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 And a question from Karine, do you use the hyperfocal distance or do you just eyeball about one thirty to the picture for focusing with the foreground interest? And how do you expose your picture to the right or slightly underexposed? Okay, um, I do not uh, use the hyperfocal method. Um, I usually, depending on the scene, if I've got some uh, subject in my foreground, whether it's some rocks or something, I will shoot a few different um, shots with different focus points and then stack those in Photoshop um, to make sure I get a good depth of field. Um, like I said, I usually shoot around F11, so you get a pretty good range um, right out of camera from that. Um, but depending on how close your foreground subject might be, um, you may need to focus there, then you know maybe halfway out through the image and then one on the back side. Typically, I won't need more than uh, three uh, different focus points to capture what I want. And then uh, what was the second part of the question? How do you expose your picture to the right or slightly under expo? Okay. Um, so there, if I'm not using filters, I'm typically going to slightly underexpose, and it's going to depend on um, your camera's capabilities and what kind of dynamic range it has. Um, it's always better to bring back shadows than trying to recover highlights. So if you lose the highlights, you're pretty much done. 
Um, you can save a little bit in the shadows and the amount that you're going to be able to save will depend on your camera. Um, but if you've got to pick or choose, I would definitely underexpose a little bit and try to bring it up. Um, but if you're shooting with filters, you can get pretty close to dead on right uh, straight out of the camera. Okay, a question from Michael. Have you done any night photography? And if so, have you used a light pollution filters? Um, I do uh, shoot some night photography. Um, I have not uh, used the night light pollution filters yet. Um, from what I've seen, they're very good and uh, do a very nice job of getting rid of some of those oranges and yellows from you know, your city lights. Um, but I have not used those yet myself. Okay, and question from Steve. What is your most used ND filters? Uh, the six stop and the 10 stop for sure. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm shooting sunrise or sunset, I'll usually use a six stop. And uh, if it's a little bit brighter midday, then I'll use. Okay. I think it's happened again. Um, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, maybe I can answer the question while waiting for, um, for Mike to get in again. So in most of the case, we, um, for, for me, I, I use Andy six stop and 10 stop most of the time. So I use six stop filters to, um, to shoot a waterscape like waterfall, seascape, and, and so on, when I need to just slightly lengthen exposure time, let's say a few seconds or um, yeah, a few seconds. When I need that extreme long exposure, for example, when, I shoot, when I'm trying to shoot the movement of, of the cloud, then I may use the 10 stop ND filters. So 10 stop ND filter can lengthen exposure time by 1000 times. So it could significantly lengthen your exposure time, let's say for a few minutes. Okay, I have um, another question from Lance. Earlier, you mentioned that the polarizer cut the exposure by one to two stop. While well, using a polarizer and six stop ND filters, will one have to take polarizer one to two stop into consideration when trying to calculate exposure time? Yes. Um, so different polarizer has, so different brands of the polarizer has, um, has different um, neutral density. For example, Nissi, uh, the polarizer from the Nissi filters can cut off about one and a half stop. So when you're calculating the exposure time, when you're stacking the polarizer and ND six stop filters, you have to take into consideration of this one and a half stop. Yeah, yeah. So with six stop and the polarizer, you have to uh, uh, calculate six, um, let's say seven and a half stop. Okay. Um, any more question? Okay, so question from Michael. Uh, one of the mistakes that have made it long exposure is not covering the viewfinder. Um, yeah, I would suggest, uh, for those of you who are using the, the DSLR, especially the DSLR, the viewfinder can be, can be a source of, of light leaking, um, especially the, the Nikon camera. So I would suggest you when you're doing a stream long exposure, so you better cover the viewfinder. Otherwise you get um, um, the light leaking and get a weird band in, in, your, in your picture. Okay, welcome back, Mark. <laughs> okay. First time you're using Zoom and apparently I'm not very good at it, so. That's okay. So a question from Lian. Thank you for your presentation. What do you think about focus stacking in landscape photography? Um, I think it's very important. I use it quite a bit. Um, definitely depends on the image and uh, what the scene has there in front of you. But you always in landscape photography want to have a nice razor sharp image uh, from front to back in my opinion. Um, so if it uh, requires it, definitely stack them and blend them in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
So question from Daniel, why we should use Nissi filters and not other? What's special in Nissi filter with other brand? Okay. You, you right. want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll give, I'll give my opinion on it. Um, so I've used tons of different brands over the years and uh, settled in on Nisi um, mainly for one reason. Um, I don't get much of a color cast at all using whether it's very clear optical glass. Um, some of the other brands I've used, I won't name them, have given either a pinkish hue or a cooler tone uh, to the images. And then you've got a little bit of work in post-processing to try to get rid of that. Um, so the quality of Nisi over some of the other ones, in my opinion, is uh, why I chose to work with them. They uh, just are a very high quality um, glass filter. And so I, I love them. Okay, so maybe I, I add a uh, few words about um, why this is this is better. So there are two things that um, the two factor that decide the quality of filter. First is the material, and second is the the coding technology. So what we use is the the highest quality optical glass. So we should exactly the same material as uh, as the Canons and Nikon use in in their lens. So optical glasses is used to, to manufacture the high precision optic, uh, optical device. So we use the highest quality optics. And second is the coating technology. So we use the so-called nano coating technology. So this is one of the best technology you can ever get um, in today's market. So with the nano coating technology, um, as Mark said, you wouldn't see any color cast in, in the filters, um, in, in your pictures, and and the resolution can can be much higher than, than other filter brand. Okay. Okay, so another question was the, the program recorded available viewer again. Yes, so this seminar is recorded. You you can go to Nisi Optic USA. Uh, either Facebook or YouTube, you can always um, play back the, the seminar today. Okay, any other question? Okay, I have one more question from uh, on YouTube. Since you're likely doing a long exposure view, the sun's already rise and set by the time the exposure is complete. What was the question? What about it? Oh, uh, let me... Let me reorganize the question. I think he, um, Lance was asking, um, so um, do you have to readjust the exposure times during the sunrise and sunset? Um, yeah, I mean, as the sun is moving quickly, um, obviously your exposure times are gonna be a little bit different. Um, obviously in the morning you're getting gaining light and in the evening you're losing light. Um, so it's, it's a little bit difficult. Um, sometimes I may deliberately underexpose or overexpose depending on which way it's going. Um, the sun's coming up and I know the scene's getting brighter as we go. I might cut it off a little bit earlier than what the app would uh, recommend to make sure I don't blow it out. And the opposite at sunset as I'm gaining or losing light, I may let it run a little bit longer. And that's there's no real science to it for me. It's just kind of a feel thing. And, um, you know, I just play it as it goes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, one more question for uh, on YouTube. I'm asking about the dreamy seascape, but trying to create a sunburst as well. You're trying to create a sunburst? Yeah, while well, doing the long exposure seascape. Um, Is that possible? I, I don't, I haven't tried it. I assume it would be possible. Um, I mean, if you've got your F-stock cranked up, that's what's gonna give you a starburst. I don't know how well it's gonna show up in the image as the sun uh, possibly is moving in a sunset type situation. No, I haven't tried that myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because it could be difficult to get a sunburst and extreme long exposure at the same time, especially when you're shooting through the sun. Yep. 
Okay, and question from Michael. I have an IREX 15 millimeter lens which use a 95 millimeter. Um, and there's a gas. Is there any gasket that do not have the inter round corners? I don't have it. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I think Michael is asking, uh, he has an IRIS 15 millimeter lens with 95 millimeter diameters. And is there any, um, is there any way to, to use the, the filters on it? I'm not familiar with that particular lens, so I don't know the answer off the top of my head, unfortunately. Yeah, we, we, have, to, we have to check. Um, if you want, you can write to me later on. Uh, I can check for you if we have the special uh, filters holder for the IREX 15 millimeter lens. Um, so usually we, we use the 150 millimeter system for the for the ultra wide angle lens, but I'm not sure about this lens. I can check for you later on. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, uh, Mark, you have anything else to, to add? Uh, no, just thank you everyone for joining me tonight. I appreciate uh, Nisi allowing me to do this. It was a lot of fun. And uh, if there's any questions um, after the fact, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email or social media. And I'd always be glad to answer any other questions. Yep. So thank, thank you, Mark. And thank you everyone for joining the, the, the seminar today. And if you are interested to, to purchase um, the Nissi filters, um, so take this advantage. Um, the, um, the coupon code here, 50% off, um, live 15 mark. So you, you can take the 15% off in, when you're shopping in the NissiOpticUSA.com. So once again, Thank you, Mark, for your wonderful presentations. And thank you, everyone. And I will see you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.